All right. You're on. All right. So um, I was reviewing um, this paper, which, uh, so, so, so actually, actually, let's start with, uh, so on Monday's meeting, Subutai uh, presented a few papers, and they all, um, they all seem to reference uh, this paper from back in the 90s, which talked about the use of um, uh, uh, sparse representations in continuous learning. And I think this is probably one of the first ones published on that, since all of the ones um, Subutai talked about had, um, they, they all use sparsity in some way. So I thought it would is be it, nice Is this sparsity or just, or just distributed representation? Is it really about sparsity? It, 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 I mean, they don't say that in the title or the abstract here, but it, it, it ends up being that way. Okay. So, I mean, because, you yeah. know, you, you think about the thousand brain theory, that is a semi-distributed representation of the world. So that those words are, you know, you know, there's, it's a sparse distributed model. So I, I, yeah. that, I don't know if they meant that here, but that, those words are very reminiscent of that. So, but, um, okay. Yeah, it's like another, another, uh, Acronym for SDR, semi-distributed yeah. representation. <laughs> semi-distributed representation. Oh, it actually is an acronym for SDR. <laughs> but, okay. but here in this one, um, when they uh, when they say semi-distributed representations, they don't necessarily mean um, it doesn't necessarily have to be sparse. Well, but, that's what but, that's what I'm asking because I, you know yeah. it, it doesn't. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have to be sparse, but um, I think it, it it ends up being very close to sparse, and you'll see what I mean um, in, in some of the okay. later stuff. You know, what's really funny is. I might actually have been at that conference. In wow. that. Cog I presented at the Cognitive Science Conference somewhere around that time. And maybe it was like a couple wow. years later. But that's pretty funny. This was right, you know, the, 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 the another beginning of another wave of connectionism, um, which then failed, you know, disappeared again for a while. So yeah. I found it interesting that this paper, um, it's, it's, it's cited. Um, a lot of other, a lot of the other papers that it cited, and then some of the ones that cited this, uh, that were published around the same time, they were all published in in cognitive science, uh, but and, and none of them were, even though they were all neural network um, papers, none of them were actually published in NeurIPS, and I guess that's because um, NeurIPS was just had just started taking off at that point. So this was like the thirteenth CogSci conference, but um, NeurIPS was only at like its first or second conference by then. But anyways, let's start. So, um, so there's there's two, uh, I guess. Uh, main types of uh, representations. Uh, one is a distributed representation, which is very common today in uh, neural networks. Like hit, the hidden layers come up with uh, fully distributed representations, where all the I guess all the all the nodes are um, being used in some way. And then you also have local representations, which are basically like one-hot encodings or something of the. And then, but but then there's there's a bit of a trade-off between these two types of representations. So neural networks and their distributed representations, they get really good generalization. Um, they're they're able to able to generalize to new new inputs. But on the other hand, um, you know when you want to train them to do something new, they're not able to retain the knowledge that they learned on um, some of the earlier things because you're updating the way that that whole representation is built. And on, the, and on the other hand, uh, representations such as one-out encodings, which are uh, local and not distributed, they are able to generally retain knowledge, but they're not very good at generalizing to um, to new inputs. So the whole goal is to get something that that that, that sort of is a trade-off and can uh, combine the idea of local representations with um, distributed representations. And so that's where semi-distributed representations come in. Okay. So um, this is one claim that uh, the author Robert French made in the paper, uh, and, it, and it's a big one that drives the motivation for everything. So catastrophic forgetting is a direct consequence of the overlap of distributed representations and can be reduced by reducing this overlap. So by overlap in representations, um, he actually uh, defines a way how we can quantify this. So if you think about, um, say you have um, four features that are represented, right, in, in, in a vector, for example, and like so. So one example, sorry, one input can be um, represented by the the orange, and another one by the green. The overlap in these two representations is just like the minimum of each of these of the values at each of the features. So here the minimum is just 0.2. Here there's no overlap at all. Um, here the overlap would be 0.9, and here 0.1. So the over, over total overlap would just be um, the average of all those values. So this, this would be a relatively high overlap, whereas here um, the overlap is a lot lower. Um, and and so because this is a, I guess this is a bit this is a bit more this is a bit closer to sparsity. Uh, to have but a sparsity. it's almost a, it's almost the definition of sparsity, right? It, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the so so what basically what um, what this guy is saying in this quote is that um, when you have uh, when you have high overlap, you're going to end up having 
uh, catastrophic forgetting uh, occur. Uh, and the reason for this is um, here on the next slide. So uh, actually, you on the previous one, uh, you know, if, if those things were binary, then this would be exactly our definition of overlap too. So it would be there would be basically equivalent. Yeah, like you have to have one in both places for there to be an overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we want to, we want to ultimately minimize this, and the motivation for uh, minimizing this overlap between inputs of two different two different representations of two different inputs is as follows. So, say here you have um, the standard uh, uh, model, which which we see in all neural networks, where you have a um, u uh, has a going into unit v, and is given by this weight. And so, when you want to calculate the activation of unit v, it's just um, a nonlinearity f applied to the total input. Uh, and that input at some point takes w multiplied by x u. x u is just the um, output of unit u. It's called this whole thing z v. So when we want to um, backpropagate the errors, um, and we want to compute the the how how uh, w is going to be updated, it's uh, essentially it essentially comes down to this term where you have this x, which is um, the total input here, which is the activation of unit u. And so W is changing uh, proportional to what X is, which is, the, which is the output of U. So if we change um, the diff if we change different weights for different inputs, then um, so, so that, meaning that like say you have different inputs or different tasks in this case. So if you're um, if X is always activating, if X is always active, then um, this then W this particular weight is going to be changing all the time. But if you have low overlap, um, which is what uh, Robert French here is advocating for, then it's only, then you, you're, this, this unit is probably only going to be active, X is only going to be uh, non-zero or large um, very, very few times. And so it's, uh, W is only going to uh, change once in a while. So that's the whole intuition here. If you have these, um, if you have sparser representations, then uh, it's not going to change, W is not going to change as much. And, and, and the goal is that uh, uh, for one specific task or one type of input, um, w is only going to activate for for that one, and then when you have a different different task, W uh, uh, X is not going to activate at all, so W won't really be changed. So each time you're just basically learning a different um, sub network on the forward pass, which means you're only updating that network on the backward pass. Yeah, can I interrupt for a second here? Um, yeah. You know, one, one thing that's always puzzled me. So this all makes sense, um, but what's one thing that's puzzled me is is well, if you're changing all the Ws. Um, but you're changing them only a little bit, right? You're not changing them all radically. It's not clear to me why exactly um, that everything is forgotten, it, it, why it's catastrophic. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it, it's like if I change all the Ws a little bit, the, does, does it still work or is it everything falls apart? Is it, is it super sensitive to every little nuance in W? Why would that be? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not obvious to me. I mean, I can see why it's better to be sparse or not changing the Ws, but it's not obvious to me how sensitive the previous learning uh, performance would be if I make minor modifications to all the Ws. I, I don't know if there's any intuition about that. Um, it's like, it seems like I, I could train another category and it would still mostly work for the other stuff, but it's apparently not. I don't know. Yeah, if you just did one little gradient update, that would be true if you just did, but usually they do lots and lots of these tiny changes until you work, until it works well on this new thing. And by then you've changed W quite a bit. Um, it could be pretty dramatic. It doesn't, so each gradient update is very small, but often they have to do lots of them in, uh, in order to actually, if you change it just a little bit, it's not going to do that well on the new task at all. So in order to actually work on the new thing, you have to make uh, more dramatic changes. Does that, does that make sense? So. I think uh, we lost Jeff. Oh, we've lost Jeff. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just move on. So, uh, so they give a, a, a suggestion of how they can um, of, uh, reduce this overlap, and basically, it's it's almost the same idea as um, doing a K winners. So, if you have this as your original input, then um, what you're doing is you're making the the ones that the features that are really large, you're making them even bigger, and the ones that are really small, you're making them even smaller. So, this is what this is doing. Um, so that's. Yeah, can you walk? walk uh, so we, that's just just a moving average of. No, what, what uh, is that? Not exactly. So, um, 
it's so it's so it's, they didn't explicitly say what alpha is, but I would assume it only makes sense that it's between zero and one. So here, um, if this, so they say this is a really, um, this is a, a old is a very high value, right? So it's closer to one, then um, whatever that, whatever is remaining, um, which it didn't get, uh, then you would sort of add that on, um, but you would add it, but you'd reduce it, you'd shrink it a bit. So like if, if, if the old value is 0.9, you'd add like, um, point zero eight or something like that to it. So it's getting closer and closer to one. And then I don't know if you this one, it, I just lost my connection for about a minute. So I don't know. Okay. Sorry yeah. What, what I was uh, saying in response to your question was quite, quite often each gradient update is just a small change, but they have to do many of them. Yeah, to actually I, heard get it to that. I think we can go on from that. So, okay. I got that. Yeah. Yeah, if it was just right. a tiny change, then it wouldn't. Uh, it's 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 still the whole system is a bit surprising to me how how you can actually get all these weights to be correct for the entire training set. Um, yet it's still it, it just it just yet yet it's not robust to, to changing. I I get it. I just I'm, all I'm pointing out is not intuitively obvious why it's like that. But it's okay. Yeah, it's not intuitively obviously why it works. Maybe that's the question. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, uh, so as I was saying about this, um, uh, this, this, in, this in a sense is kind of like K winners because you can choose the you can choose the number of um, uh, features that you want to make bigger and how many you want to make smaller. Um, it's like I guess it's a, it's almost a softened version of um, of, uh, of of K winners where um, where if, if I guess if you set alpha to one, then that would just be equivalent of K winners. In a sense. Well, it's not comparing to the other ones, is it? Um, uh, it it's just oh, uh, you, so w the ones that um, so you have to know which ones are sharpened and which ones are reduced. Uh, you know that you have to know that based on the relative rank ordering. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So here he's he's just looking at activations. Uh, he's not looking at weights at all, and no, he's I'm sharpening sure. the active activations to emphasize the ones that are already higher and de-emphasize the ones that are lower. That's yeah. That's, that's how he's mimicking yes. sparsity. That's kind of like a K winners, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, after seeing this, uh, I just wanted to make the connection back to what Subatai presented on Monday. So we talked about this paper OML where they claim to have very sparse um, activations. Uh, in, in one of their intermediate layers, I think after they did all the, after they did the, the after they passed everything through the representation learning network, they showed that like they were getting roughly 3.8% um, uh, uh, activation and, but, but on average, all the units were activating for different inputs. So it's not like th there were no, there were no uh, dead neurons here. Um, and that made me think that, you know, in this case, since, since they are using ReLU here, um, and, and a lot of the units are actually zero, uh, have gone to zero. Um, but when they're when they're learning this network, um, when they're doing the backward pass, I, I would hypothesize that they're probably um, it's probably it's probably looking something like this, where only very few weights are being updated. Um, so that that in a sense is like I guess one one advantage here that uh, as opposed to regular dense networks, you know, a lot of the weights aren't even going to be touched here in this case. So. Mm -hmm. So um, and then that seemed to do. Um, well for them, so I guess there's uh, it's worth investigating whether or not um, this this idea of just updating a uh, very few number of weights at a time uh, would be helpful. Okay, and finally, um, also a few weeks ago, um, I guess I, I I've shown all these graphs before, but a few weeks ago, um, you know, I I tried out uh, on, on a, a continu sim simple continuous learning task uh, the different uh, dense network versus a sparse network. So there's no there's no uh, weight consolidation penalty or anything here. This is just um, this is just a regular loss, and um, I found that I guess the the, the differences the difference here wasn't too big, but um, the, the sparsity could explain possibly why I, got, I was able to get um, higher accuracy with a sparse network on split MNIST, but then um, I couldn't get that on on the on GSC. So, and Karan, the dense ones are using probably in that case. Uh, dense ones are using uh, K winners. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Dense is using ReLU. Um, sparse is using K winners. Yeah. Yeah. If you go back to so that, that's that's good. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, you know, in our, so this 
what you're showing in the feed forward network is because the activations are sparse and the weight updates are going to be proportional to the activation, only a small number of those weights will actually get updated, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, in, in our case, we also have sparse weights. So the connectivity is also sparse. So, so even in some of the cases where the activity is high, the weights will be zero. So the actual fraction that gets updated is going to be even smaller um, than if you just had sparse activations. So I just wanted to uh, kind of point that out. Yeah. Yeah. So you will, not just, you will update a really tiny part of the network. Yeah, not just the weight's going to be zero, but we also kill the gradient just to complement. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. And, and that's kind of what happens in, in, H, in our HTM models too. Only a, like a very, very precise, specific part of the subnetwork is updated at any point in time. But I just, uh, Subutai, going back to what you said, uh, if you look at the, the update rules here, um, so when, when the uh, activation is zero, that kills the gradient right there. But um, the weight being zero, does that also kill it? Because it's not going to make this, this term zero, is it? Yeah, it, it, it's... Uh... Well, what we we have two things when a connection when a weight is uh, it's not that the weight is zero it's that the connection is missing, so we enforce that with a mask. So it's it's not that the weight is zero and we increment it and it becomes non-zero. It's it's actually the connection it's, is missing. Um, so that that's another thing. And then uh, and as Lucas said, that also impacts gradient flow back to previous parts of the network as well. Could, could I ask a quick question of that? <clears throat> if, uh, if we're applying the mask, we're applying the mask to the gradients. So the gradients are being computed, then being clamped to zero for those connections? Uh, yeah, there are a few different ways to do it. I, I think our current approach is just to multiply the weights with a binary mask, and that will just kill the gradients. Um, so there was energy in the gradients, but it's not trying to be redistributed anywhere. It's just being suppressed. Yeah, that's an implementation, but conceptually, the way to think about it is, is it's not that the weight is zero, it's that the weight is missing. It, it's just the connection is not there. That's okay. the way, and in that case, there just wouldn't be any gradients. And so we implement it by suppressing it, uh, but just to take advantage of PyTorch's vectorized operations and, and stuff. But that's, that's just an implementation detail. You could imagine implementing it you know, by five different ways. Um, the, the, the important thing is it's not that it's a weight of zero that could then become positive or negative, is that the connection is just not there. That's the, that's the way to think about it. And there's a, there's a distinction between those two. There are a few dynamic sparse methods that make use of that uh, wasted energy, Kevin, like you said. So you, you just separately, you keep track of all the gradients, even if you're not updating. And then if at some point a connection has a lot of accumulated grid, then, it, then you let that connection grow and you, you put it back in the network. So some, some dynamic sparse methods take advantage of that. Yeah, okay. and, the, and the intuition there from a neuroscience standpoint is it's, that's kind of like Hebbian, you know, if, if these two things are uh, kind of working together, but there's no connection, then you would want to grow a connection there. That's the kind of neuroscience uh, intuition for it. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks thanks Haran. It's it's interesting to know that back in 91 French was thinking about this stuff. That that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think uh, what I like about it is that um, you know, so it's, it connects sparsity with uh, continuous learning. So I think there yeah. that's it's a promising direction. Um, also, yeah. just wanted to mention. I, I must, um, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that um, it just it just came to me that uh, I think there was another method um, that that was proposed for uh, obtaining this sort of uh, this sort of update where um, they they compute the gradient as regular, but then um, they're on the backward on the backward pass. There's they're only taking the 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 top um, like the top k. Uh, partial derivative values and zeroing out everything else. That way, you're you're penalizing the weights that um, that caused the biggest uh, or had, had explained the loss the most. That was just okay, another who, uh, method. Who's doing that? Who's doing that? French was doing that or OML? No, no, that was um, that was another paper, Cortier. I can I can um, link you to that. Okay.
but that, that, yeah, that was another technique someone had. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, that was interesting. Karan, uh, I have a curiosity on that slide. I don't know if you know the answer, but there is a method in the middle, S-I-N-N, and it, it shows a lot of dead neurons. Do, do you know why or what that method is doing? Could, could you repeat that? So in your slide, you have three methods there, like pre-training, um, OML, and then the one in the middle, S-I-N-N, and that one shows a lot of dead neurons, right? Yeah. Um, here they were. You know why? Uh, I no, I'm, I'm, I forget what this one is. Subutai, do you recall? Uh, I'm sorry, the SRNN. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a different method. Um, I'll, I'll look it up. It might have been a recurrent. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious as to why there are a lot of dead neurons on that one and not in OML. So, but what, I mean, what makes that? I think it's the other. To me, it's a little confusing the other way around because you know we found that the spatial cooler, he ended up with dead neurons, and and two, you had a boosting function, and so that seems like a, a natural thing to do. And so I was surprised that you all the units were active in the OML and the pre-training thing without any kind of boosting. So that, to me, that was like, oh, how did that happen? As opposed to why there's a lot of dead neurons in that. I would have thought there'd be dead neurons everywhere. But. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, one of the points they're making in this chart is that through OML, they were able to get something like boosting. But the way they did it is they used an uh, evolutionary approach to train the sparse network so that it worked well on continuous learning. So it's kind of, it was this very sort of, uh, um, computationally intensive approach to come up with the sparse representation it, such that it worked well for continuous learning. And mm -hmm. then they found that, oh, look, it discovered sparsity and that actually mm -hmm. uh, the units are much more. It, it, it made uh, me know. wonder if, it, if, if we just took our sort of spatial pooler mechanism for sparsity and apply that to these networks, how would it? Exactly, to... exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that was so. part of our discussion on Monday. It's like, we, you don't have to go through necessarily this whole meta learning process to do it. Yeah, I, I, so I guess I missed that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is, it is I, I thought it was nice that it, they, they, the best solution they discovered was something that was sparse and had a boosting like impact. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Not too long. Yeah. Yeah. Should I stop? That wasn't too bad, Karan. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> nice job, Karan. <laughs>